gives me great pleasure to use this meeting uh, to explain to you uh, the contents of a very important book that I published uh, and was launched in New York uh, in October last year. Uh, and I hope that uh, some of the things that I have to say uh, will form the basis of the discussion in this room, but also that you will be able to take away with you uh, in the decisions that you need to make. Um, something that I found very heartening is that at the heads of retail uh, table here this, uh, this morning, there are not just uh, retail bankers, but also uh, technology players, platform players, uh, who are disrupting uh, the whole universe of financial services. And I'm sure that in the years to come, a table like this will be filled with many different players uh, playing an important role in shaping the future of finance. The book that I've written uh, is entitled The Great Transition. While they're pulling up my file, uh, I'll just say this to you. Uh, how you title your book is very important. Uh, it was a challenge trying to capture everything that is taking place in financial services and to give it a unified theme. So I chose the great transition, but without having uh, Googled uh, what other books were, had the same title. And it was after it was published that I realized that most of the books with the title great transition were about the afterlife. Okay, so, so this is the one book which is about the future of finance. Uh, there are a few books uh, in the medical industry uh, which talks about the great transitions uh, in uh, technology in the medicine industry, but uh, this is the first book uh, with a title like this in the finance industry. The subtext of the great transition is that the personalization of finance is here. And I'm making this assertion uh, to raise the quality of discussion, the understanding of where the future of finance is heading, uh, and uh, the thinking that needs to go into what all of us have to make in terms of decisions. Um, to be caught with the mundane, everyday challenges of banking, uh, operational risk, uh, technology, infrastructure, customers and so on, is to miss the point of where this industry is heading and why we should not swim against the tide, meaning flow with the tide, embrace the, the, the changes that technology is bringing to us, uh, and then ace the game. So what is the game? Where is it taking us? Um, can I? Yeah, so the book was launched in, uh, on October 20th last year in New York. And as you can see, uh, Barney Frank, uh, or former Congressman Barney Frank, uh, who wrote one of the two uh, forwards in the book, uh, was the guest of honor at my launch. And then I had two other people uh, at the meeting, one who chaired the meeting, and I also had Ron Shevlin, uh, who is a very respected banking analyst in the US, and Ron and I are very good friends in terms of uh, exchanging notes about the developments taking place in the US today uh, and uh, the rest of the world. Um, the other person who was very important uh, in the launch of this book uh, was uh, Robert, uh, or, sorry, Richard Sandor. Okay, and Richard has become a very dear friend. Uh, now, Richard Sandor in the 1970s uh, was the creator of the interest rate exchange, the creator of the idea that you can trade um, your cost of funds on an exchange. Uh, and more recently, he's also the creator of the climate exchange uh, in the US, which has now set the infrastructure uh, for climate bond trading around the world and how uh, the price of carbon credit uh, is able to fund a lot of the transition uh, technologies that are shaping uh, the energy uh, world that we live in right now. Um, and 
these two gentlemen are very important to me personally because their respect and their affirmation uh, of the ideas that I have in my book are very important uh, for it to have a global perspective. Now, uh, Barney Frank is a very dear friend. I, I, I put the most, uh, sen the most decent photograph I could find. I spent a lot of time in his house. We debate a lot on a lot of the issues that are shaping the banking industry. Right now, uh, as uh, the US has uh, shut down Signature Bank, which was the bank that he was a board member of, uh, and we have had discussions on things like um, the cutoff point for uh, systemically important banks in the US. Uh, they had set it at $150 billion and Signature Bank falls below that. Uh, and because of that, it gives the regulators an excuse uh, for not having, um, for not having um, you know, um, regulated it and supervised it more closely. Uh, so there is a lot of rich uh, conversations that have gone into the creation of this book and subsequent to this creation, some of the amazing dramatic things that are taking place uh, in the industry today. I thought that the best way for me to explain what is in this book, and actually uh, we, have, we have made it uh, available to uh, the heads of retail who are present here, uh, and you know, I'll be sitting outside afterwards to um, you know, autograph copies uh, if any one of you are interested. Um, but let me explain to you uh, the content of the book and the key ideas that hopefully will form a basis of today's discussion. Um, the forwards are important, uh, and it's very important uh, for you to realize that the forwards are written by people, by iconic individuals in the banking industry who do not necessarily agree with me or with each other. So the future of the finance industry is not uh, a given. There is no agreement uh, that there's a lot of thinking that goes into the process and understanding the fundamentals and agreeing on the principles are more important than in agreeing on the direction of where the industry is going. Um, I start the preface by telling the story of ICE. And this is how, and that is why uh, the cover of the book carries, uh, you know, this visual of ICE. What is ICE? In the 1700s, ice was something that you saw out of a lake, of a frozen lake, put it on horse-drawn carriages and transport it far away to cities like New York or uh, Havana uh, in order for it to be found inside your glass of drink. Um, and think about how inefficient ice used to be. And today, what is ice? Ice is something that you uh, generate in the refrigerator when you want it and how you want it and, and why you want to use it. Now, what made that difference? Uh, and what is uh, the technology that went into being able to personalize ICE? So when I talk about the personalization of finance, I have the metaphor of the technologies that went into enabling ICE to become personalized. When you think about finance today, the money in your pocket might have swirled around the world twice through the SWIFT network, okay, subject to inflation, exchange rate, uh, interest rates, bank charges, carrying costs before it reaches you. And that's how inefficient the money business is today. And where is it heading? It's heading to a point where one day, um, you and I will be able to transact with each other directly and what's mind-boggling is that you and I will be able to generate value and communicate that value and, and exchange that value with someone else. The magic of technologies like cryptocurrencies, for example, and I know that in this room, not everybody is necessarily for or against cryptocurrencies, but the magic of cryptocurrencies is that each one of us, I can issue my own crypto, you can, you can, you can every one of us. The question is, if I issued my own crypto, what value will it carry? Will it be trusted by you or someone else who needs to have a transaction with me? And these are some of the questions uh, that are being answered uh, in, the in the future of the technology of finance. Now, the rest of the book, um, 
the best way for me to explain uh, the ideas that are generated in the book is that in the first part of the book, I talk about the philosophy of where the te technology in finance is taking us. So the first most important philosophy that we need to uh, embrace and come to terms with is that technology itself is making a transition, hence the title, from its platform origins to personalization. Platforms were, was the technology that was originated in the 1990s, Amazon, and then later Microsoft, and all the platforms that you see, the social media platforms and so on, Alibaba, and, and so on, okay, to be able to onboard as many customers as possible, and then to monetize them. That's platform. And bankers thought that we are able to mimic the platform technologies uh, that was originated by these technology players. But guess what? This technology is also shifting. So the players that, uh, that were able to ace the game are now starting to disintegrate. Who would have ever thought that Google will look shaky when chat GPT came into force? And that this will happen within 15 years of the origins of Google, right? And who would have ever thought that a TikTok would surpass Facebook in terms of new customer growth? Facebook is officially in decline because last year the numbers started to go into decline and, and then in exchange for TikTok. Now, what is TikTok? It is mobile technology, which is a little more than two dimensional. And think about what is going to happen to TikTok when the metaverse and three-dimensional um, technologies start to come into being. So the first thing I want to make it clear to all of us is that the, the platform itself is shifting. So when you think about digital banking, don't think about what the platform players did in the 1990s or the 2000s. Think about where we are heading and, and how that's going to look like. Um, the second is that the idea of how value is transacted. So I started this briefing by saying to you that anyone in this room can issue a cryptocurrency, which means that any one of us can issue something of value that can be transacted with someone else. Um, and this is an underpinning. This is a, a fundamental idea that we need to have at the back of our minds as we see the technologies evolve. Now, in the second part of the book, I talked about uh, the underlining principles that are driving the financial services today, industry today. So I talk about the financialization of everything. What are our corporations telling us? What is GE telling us? GE, Jeff Emmel in 2014 made this remark that GE is no longer going to be a manufacturer of manufactured goods, but a player in the data industry. What is Tesla the vehicle? It is not a car. It is a huge conglomeration of data that can be traded, that can be financialized, uh, and that can, add, that can be transacted in terms of value and information. That can become financial information, right? So we are now going through a phase where, where we are looking, the world and the economies in the world are looking for any excuse to financialize any kind of asset. Um, and the moment you're able to capture it as data, you're able to financialize it. And so what I'm saying is that uh, we will not be able to financialize everything, but uh, as we learn what is financializable and what is not, uh, we will start to stabilize and, and create a, a new economy <clears throat> that doesn't exist today. Another element that is, um, that is shaping the future of finance, and this is something that all of us here as, you know, as um, representatives of institutions need to be aware of, is that the customer is closing in on us. In other words, the industry is being defined by the user and not by the supply side, not by the institutions, not by you and I. And users are, forming conglomerations, forming associations, uh, chatting with each other. And we have a, 
a number of experiences in the last few years uh, that showed that. Um, you know, you had uh, the Reddit revolution of uh, retail customers pushing back on short sellers, for example. Um, and then I go into explaining who the agents of change are and what their roles are. So, for example, I say something like uh, people create people or people shape people. You know what's very interesting in, in any industry, in the future of any industry? It is still shaped by people. It's still shaped by you by what Raymond does in Cambodia, by, you know, by what um, uh, any one of you do, Mary does in Hong Kong or whoever, okay, in this room, uh, whatever you do, the decisions you make, standing up to regulators uh, and, and forcing your argument true, you are shaping the future of finance as anyone else is. Um, and then I talk about uh, the anatomy of innovation, which is, uh, what is what are the factors that go into shaping innovation? And right now in the U.S., as the regulators debate whether cryptocurrency is a commodity, is a security, or an asset or a token that can be transacted, um, that's the uh, kind of argument that goes into shaping uh, how the future of finance will evolve. Now, in the third part of the book, I come back to reality and I. Um, deal with some of the uh, realities that you and I face today. Um, and I start by saying that, you know something, the banking industry at the end of the day, it's a balance sheet industry. Um, and the buy now, pay later people, they really wanted to make it a technology industry. They were saying that if you create uh, frictionless transactions, uh, you will create an industry that doesn't exist today. When in actual fact, the back end of the back, the, the buy now, pay later industry was still old fashioned, um, you know, credit card transactions. And it was shaped at the end of the day by the cost of funds that you have and the risks that you take on board and your ability to utilize capital uh, in order to survive the process. So the interesting thing as we think about a lot of technology issues in finance, uh, we still need to go back to the balance sheet to see where the industry is taking us. Um, and then I go into challenging the financial institutions. So I'm challenging you today. Can you imagine a day when the deposit business is no longer important to you? Can you imagine banking without the deposit business? Right? Now, just imagine this. It's the same as saying to Kodak in 1995, holding up a yellow box of Kodak film and saying to Kodak, can you imagine a day when this yellow box does not exist anymore? And Kodak, along with a number of other um, you know, film companies, actually invented digital film. But what did they do? They couldn't imagine a world without the yellow box the 35 mm film that you saw anywhere in the world, any tourist location you went to the beach, you will see the yellow box. And they thought that it's the, the product that defined them and that, that created a mode that made it impossible for uh, others to come and compete and remove it from them. And what happened in the early 2000s, Sony put technology into the hands of consumers. And by 2007, the iPhone revolutionized the idea of cameras, and by 2010, Kodak was bankrupt. And that is why I ask you to imagine, can you imagine a day when de the deposit business doesn't exist anymore? And that day, guess what? It's here. Why? In the US, any financial institution that had the lowest cost and ability to garner deposit was a clear and runaway winner. And there were players like Vernon Hill, if you'll remember him, who set up company, a bank called uh, bank, Commerce Bangkok, who aced the game by being the lowest cost depositor called deposit collector in the US. And then instead of lending it out, he, he invested in mortgage-backed securities and uh, bonds and treasury bonds. It was the safest business in the world. And guess what? 
just a few days ago, the banks that had the lowest cost deposit were exactly the ones that went under. The revolution is here. And why did it go under? We think about the risk side of the equation, which is that uh, they didn't, uh, well, Silicon Valley Bank, with whom I've had a couple of two um, internal briefings on what a beautiful bank it was. It had a clear customer base, it had a stable customer base, and so on. And you think that the problem was the, uh, was the you know, the, the balance sheet and the uh, investment in uh, mortgage-backed securities. You know what the problem was? The speed at which customers could withdraw their money. The speed now no longer allows the bank even three days to be able to go out and look for a new investor to show up against the losses that they were incurring. It was instant, right? So that's the impact of the technology on the balance sheet that we need to become a, a mindful of. And what is deposits today? I spend a lot of time in China, and guess what? In China, I don't carry a wallet. Why? Because all my money sits on a digital wallet. And who holds the digital wallet? It's WeChat or Alipay. The bank is invisible to me. And why is the visible wallet, a, a, a digital wallet, an important part of my everyday life in, in China? Because it is put on a platform and it is connected to my everyday life. And what is a deposit account? It is a static, historical accounting general ledger at the back end of a bank that I need to go to an ATM to withdraw to use and add three to five extra steps for which I'm not even being paid an interest that, that makes it worth my time. So when you think about the most beloved of products in financial services and how that's got to be um, you know, disrupted uh, and where that is taking us, then you need to start looking at your business and saying, I can't be in love with my business anymore. I need to see where this is taking me. And then I talk about where the next um, banking crisis will come from. And remember, I wrote this book more than two years ago. In fact, I, wrote, I took about 12 years writing this book, by the way, because I had to go through a transition myself in being in love with exactly what you are in love with, uh, and then taking a position as to, you know, sitting outside the industry and looking in and being dispassionate about where it's heading. And so what I said in, in the book was that the next financial crisis will be based on intangible assets. The regular banking writers and academics in the US today write books such as this time it's different, in meaning this time it's not different, that banking crises are the same every time. But look at your own balance sheet. In 1984, a bank's balance sheet, when Basel I was created, was about mortgages that sat on the book of the bank. In 1987, when the first securities crisis came about, it was about securities that the banks lent to. By 1992, when the first country crisis, the Mexican crisis and so on came about, and then up to 1997, which was the Asian financial crisis, it was about, um, about exposure to foreign exchange debt uh, and increasingly um, you know, to markets. By 2000s, when Basel III came about, the Basel Committee had started to recognize that the balance sheet of a bank is increasingly ephemeral. There is no underlining assets that you are making more money from your trading book than you were from your, in, uh, from your asset liability mix. By 2008, it was the Wall Street banks that took us to the cleaners and back. And then this year, the main street banks that fell didn't fall because of the balance sheet, but they fell because of a very small influence of something called cryptocurrencies, which does not have any underlying asset, which did not even sit in the balance sheet of any of these banks, not in Silvergate, not in um, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, and not in 
signature bank, which was um, which was uh, closed down as an you know as a precautionary uh, problem uh, related to Silicon Valley Bank. I've got so much to share with you uh, on what I've covered in the book. The book is both um, expensive in terms of the the range and the width of the issues that we cover, and deep because. I go down to the very DNA of the banking industry. And so I want to leave you with these four things that hopefully will contribute to our discussion today. Platforms to personalization. How then should you be thinking about digital banking? You know, the funny thing about the metaverse is that when the banks that are doing pilot projects in the metaverse, what have they created? They've created bank branches in the metaverse. In the metaverse, who wants to go to a bank branch? We want to play games. We want to exchange value. We want to stake and generate income through creating tokens. Not visit another bank branch. So that's the, the platform to personalization phase. And there are other, a couple of other themes that, um, that I'd like to leave you with. Technology. Uh, what should we be thinking about technology? And a simple thought about technology is that the technology that sits outside the institution is becoming more important than the technology that sits in the institution. I have talked to many core banking vendors and I've asked them uh, how they're making the transition to digital banking. They are moving way too slow. And then, how do we think about cryptocurrencies and decentralized finance? I know that the regulators in many countries are angry, uh, afraid about the implications of cryptocurrencies and decentralized finance. But I want you to think about this aspect of decentralized finance. You take any one of the cryptocurrencies, Solana, Tezos, Uniswap, Ethereum, what each one of these represents is Solana, 300,000 programmers around the world creating applications on it. What each of these cryptos represent is $80 billion about there of capital that is being garnered to make this technology transformations. That is the threat that you're up against, not whether to regulate or deregulate or re-regulate crypto in the context of traditional banking. And so when we look at the challenges that are being created, uh, in fact, it was the BIS, uh, the Bank for International Settlements, uh, that has now started issuing papers saying that you may not like cryptocurrencies, but you must start thinking about the technology they represent and how we can onboard the technology that into how we run our institutions, the, the value that we create, the assets and how they are transacted. But guess what? Even how we are organized, think about the treasury function in a bank today and how, how human resource driven it is. That is, is people centric. In a decentralized finance app, they automate the whole process that decisions can be made instantaneously. And that's the technology that banks will start to embrace very much, uh, very soon in the future. The mass amateurization of finance, your customer is your product. Your customer is making themselves the definer of the product and not whatever it is that you have to sell to them. So it's not moving this direction, it's coming back to you from the ground up. And so I've just uh, also given you a hint as to what I think uh, will be the ingredients of the next financial crisis. And I think about that in order to encapsulate where this technology is taking us. So I hope that you will enjoy this book. Uh, and if you happen to purchase it on Kindle, or some platform, uh, please give me your feedback. Feedback is very important. I have no problems in being ridiculed uh, or, or challenged um, or, or disagreed with. 
because it's not the disagreement, it's the principles that we all share. Thank you.